Perhaps one reason for the lack of a wider uptake of target-specific oral anticoagulants is the absence of approved reversal agents. Here at AHA 2015, we saw phase three results on one reversal agent presented as a late-breaking clinical trial and published simultaneously along with another paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. One, uh, Anexa-R is the trial, and that was presented here, and data from Anexa-A were also published in the New England Journal. I am with Dr. Mark Crowther, MD, who is professor and chair of the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine in McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Before we talk about Indexanet Alpha, how important is it first to have, in this case, a universal antidote for factor XA inhibitors? Uh, it's super important, I think, to have a universal antidote because the 10A inhibitors are becoming more and more frequently used in clinical practice. They've really changed the approach to anticoagulation of patients at high risk of blood clots, including patients with atrial fibrillation and deep vein thrombosis. And when we talk to clinicians who use these drugs, one of the things I identify as a concern is the lack of a reversal agent. It may actually be inhibiting their use of these drugs, which we know reduce the risk of complications like stroke. And in this case, it's kind of complicated. There are a couple of trials, an exa R and an exa A, and an exa R has like a part one, a part two. Can you kind of just go through these and tell us what you're uh, doing? Absolutely. So in this study that we presented today, we're presenting one quarter of the total study. The entire study was published today in the New England Journal of Medicine. Essentially what we did is we took the two most commonly used anti-factor 10A inhibitors in the United States, apixaban and rivaroxaban, and we looked at whether or not and andexanet alpha, the reversal agent, is able to reverse um, those drugs. So we took a pixaban, we gave the indexinet alpha as a bolus and showed it acutely reversed the effect. And then we looked to see if you gave a bolus followed by an infusion, if the reversal was sustained. And that was previously presented and was published today. And in fact, it did. So that's two studies, the bolus followed by the bolus plus infusion for a pixaban. And then the same for rivaroxaban, a bolus followed by a bolus plus an infusion study. Today, we presented for rivaroxaban, the bolus plus the infusion study and showed, as we expected from our earlier phase work, that we produced near complete and sustained reversal of the rivaroxaban effect for the duration of the infusion. So how fast does it work and uh, how safe? So it, it works instantaneously effectively. So if you look at the surrogate marker we used for efficacy, which is the anti-factor 10A level, it was essentially instantaneous. Within a couple of minutes of administration, that effect had been reduced almost to nothing. And the product lasts for, the half-life of the product is quite short. So that's why you need to give an infusion afterwards to sustain that. From a safety perspective, the drug appears very safe. We've given it to probably almost 200 patients now in various studies, perhaps a few more if you include the very early phase work. And there really hasn't been any significant Again, infusional toxicity rates of adverse reactions similar to that seen with placebo in the studies. In an accompanying editorial in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, Gene Connors, uh, MD, notes that the different doses are all based on both the type of factor XA inhibitor and the time from the last dose, which because there are various different doses, she says that's the, the one problem is that there's a potential to complicate its use in busy emergency departments. There is, and that's because it turns out that for rivaroxaban, there's just more drug present than there is for apixaban. And since this is a one-to-one -one inhibition, we need to inhibit with approximately the right amount of the drug. So there's going to be a larger dose of andexanet if someone has recently taken, recently taken a dose of rivaroxaban than apixaban. The goal, obviously, will be to make that as clear as possible in the dosing algorithm, but I don't think it's going to end up that there's going to be one kind of dose that fits all. There's going to be probably one or two doses that people are going to have to be familiar with in order to use this for the average patient who shows up with a complication of therapy. So where are we now? So right now we've completed the um, studies uh, in healthy volunteers, that's what we presented today. That information has been completed and is being uh, analyzed and collected. Uh, the results were published today in the New England Journal. Uh, now we're into the next study, which is a study where the drug is being given to patients who are actively bleeding, who are receiving rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, or the low molecular weight heparin enoxaparin. And that study is currently recruiting patients in about 35 centers in the US with plans to expand to Europe. One thing, despite limitations that were brought up, Dr. Connors did conclude with Andexanet represents a giant step forward in our ability to control anticoagulation therapy. Yeah, it, it is a very, very important step forward. And the reason it's an important step forward is that traditionally we give the blood thinning therapies and we are accounting for not having a reversal agent by saying they're so effective. They're reducing the bad things that can happen. We're willing to take a little bit of an excess risk. And this will help with that. You know, for example, the most commonly used blood thinning agents are actually aspirin and clopidogrel. And those have been around for 20, 30, 40, 100 years in some cases. And we don't have a reversal strategy for them. So with these new agents, they've been around for three, four, five, six years. And now we're getting into the era where we'll have a specific reversal strategy, which will really, I think, provide reassurance to clinicians it's safe to use those products. And if a patient does have bleeding, it 
should reduce the toxicity of that bleeding event. And the development seems to be fast-tracked. I mean, this, this appears to be something that is important and everything is moving along as quickly as possible. Yeah, I would say that the development is moving forward at a breakneck pace. Um, hard to manage, I think, to move things forward this, this fast, but the FDA has expressed to us an enthusiasm for getting this project done as quickly as possible. And certainly, the study we're doing right now is actually recruiting faster than we anticipated, which I think is a sign that clinicians really do see a need for this product. Terrific. Well, we have uh, highlights from the American Heart Association in CardioSource World News and CardioSource World News Interventions, where I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.